Thank you all so much, um, and thank you, Carl. And thank you to everyone here at the Center for inviting me. This is a great turnout. I have uh, been on tour with this book for a few months, and uh, some of the crowds are small, some of them are large, um, and it's always exciting to speak to many people, as we, I will tonight. Um, I'll add one more thing to my resume, which he so kindly uh, articulated a few minutes ago. I was a senior producer at ABC News for a number of years and worked very closely with the late Peter Jennings. Uh, we co-authored a book together called The Century, which was uh, uh, one of the great achievements, I believe, of my career, and I just wanted to mention that and uh, give tribute to Peter, who was a great colleague and a great newsman. Um, so I, I uh, set out to write this book about Abraham Lincoln. I thought, no one's ever written a book about Abraham Lincoln before. <laughs> In fact, only 23,275 books have been written about Abraham Lincoln. So many that the uh, UPS guy who came to deliver bundles of books to me regularly as I did my research, one day cornered me and he said, you know, Mr. Brewster, uh, you're writing a book about Lincoln, right? And I said, yeah, and he said, well, what I don't get is how does the Lincoln story really change? I mean, how can you write something different than that's already been written? I mean, in your version, does he survive the assassination? I mean, <laughs> and I looked at him long and hard, and I told him to get off my property and never come back ever again. Um, just to give you a feeling for how hard it is to find material to write about Abraham Lincoln, let me tell you some of the names of the books that have been written about Abraham Lincoln, how far we've come in our study of this great man. The list of 23,275 includes the life of Abraham Lincoln for young people as told in words of one syllable. The personal finances of Abraham Lincoln. One of my favorites, Abraham Lincoln on the coming of the Caterpillar tractor. <laughs> and the first published only a decade ago, the physical Lincoln, which includes the following chapters, lips, gut, skull, muscles, skin, eyes, height, and joints. So if you had any desire to read about Abraham Lincoln's kneecaps, you could actually find a source for that in the literature that's been written about Abraham Lincoln. The idea of writing this book about the Emancipation Proclamation, though, did come to me after uh, a friend suggested that with the 150th anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation coming, wouldn't it be a great moment to celebrate what an achievement that was? I, I thought I was the wrong person to write about it, honestly. Uh, I had written a history of the 20th century, but I didn't know a lot about the 19th century. I, Lincoln was not necessarily a preoccupation of mine. I had an admiration for him, as I think most of you probably do, as one of our greatest, if not our single greatest president. But I spent a considerable amount of time uh, bathing in the literature about the Emancipation Proclamation, learning more about how he got to the decision to issue the Emancipation Proclamation, and found myself intrigued and found myself wanting to dig deeper and deeper and deeper into the story, and then feeling as though there was something, and this is a great inspiration as a writer to come across this, there was something that had not been said, you know, there was something that had not been written about this. There was something that was fresh and new and exciting to me. I'm not only a, a popular historian, I'm also a journalist, so to me, one of the exciting things about the kind of work that I did on this and the kind of work that I sought to do is to come upon it with some skepticism. I mean, I, I admire Abraham Lincoln, but like many people, I think when you see someone held up onto a pedestal, you want to sort of make sure the pedestal is really made of the real material. Um, that he deserves to be up there, that he's not sort of uh, being used as an example of our desire to worship heroes and create heroes. Um, I wanted to see him as a real man, too. I want to understand how this self-educated uh, backwoodsman from the western part of the country, as they called it then, rose to a position of power and and to a position of such historic importance that we really lay at the feet of Abraham Lincoln a distinct part of what it means to be an American. A few years ago, 
a wonderful uh, uh, constitutional law scholar at Yale named Akhil Amar and I set out to do a, a lecture series, a lecture um, on the, on sort of the um, notion of what would make a perfect president. That was the title, the perfect president. If we were actually to construct the man or woman whom we felt was exemplified all the characteristics that we most need in order to succeed in the presidency, what would that person look like? And it was a kind of exercise, it was 2008, so it was kind of exercise in the middle of a presidential year in order to understand it more completely. The process, we had brilliant presidents before who were terrible in the office. We had people who we thought of as uh, less than intelligent who nonetheless had the command and the sense of leadership to actually make much more of the office. John Quincy Adams was probably the most prepared person ever to be president. At the age of 14, he was translating uh, for the American diplomat to the Russian court, translating the French um, because he was so proficient in the language. Imagine that, the age of 14. He was brilliant. He spoke many languages, was better read probably than any president in American history, and he was a horrible president. And we looked at it and discovered that so many presidents in American history reflected two kind of uh, important principles, uh, and important backgrounds. One was time spent in the military, and the other one was time spent as a lawyer, or at least studying the law. And how many American presidents exhibited either one part or another from those in their resumes before they became president we realized that that really sort of articulated two really important principles in American life, one being liberty, the other one being equality. You think of the, the warrior as representing the protection of liberty, right? You think of the lawyer as representing the defense of justice. And here we have these two very important principles in American life, liberty and equality, battling with each other, which they do in all kinds of constitutional questions, all kinds of political questions, that is, they, are the two, they are the two bookends of the American identity. It was perfect, to use the title from our, our lecture, for 2008 because we had in John McCain a warrior running against Barack Obama, a lawyer, and so we thought it was an astonishing way to look at this. And of course, we could look back at American history and say, if you wanted to choose the two greatest American presidents, and most polls of this sort usually pull out Washington and Lincoln, well, Washington was a warrior and Lincoln was a lawyer. Well, in the six months leading up to the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation, Lincoln also became a warrior. He became a warrior president. Uh, the war was two years old by the time the story that I have written here begins in July 13th, 1862. The prospects for the Union were pretty bad at that point. The enthusiasm for the war had waned in the North. Wars, we were talking about this at dinner tonight, wars are always, everybody thinks wars are going to be over quickly. World War I was supposed to be over by Christmas. We thought the war in Iraq was over quickly and it turned out not to be. But throughout American history, the Civil War was certainly an example of this. People wanted the war to be over quickly, and they thought it would be over quickly. Two years out, it seemed very old already. And Lincoln was struggling with the issue of mission. What was the war really about? He had to that point said the war was about saving the Union. And yet for the Northern soldiers, it was a hard argument to say, that they were fighting for something so abstract as to ensure that the people of New York were part of the same national entity as the people of South Carolina. Much easier to make the justification for mission in the South where they're protecting their homeland, much harder in the North. And of course there was the abolitionist fervor, uh, fervor in the North that was pushing Lincoln persistently to declare this war was not only about saving the Union, it was also about ending slavery, this great scourge on the American idea. 
So on July 13, 1862, Lincoln gets into a carriage with Secretary of State Seward and Secretary of the Navy Gideon Wells. And they're riding to the funeral of James Stanton, the young infant uh, who had just died, the son of the Secretary of War, Edwin Stanton. Through Georgetown, through the cobblestone streets with the carriage riding through the rain and the mud, very similar to the rain and the mud that he had rode in in a similar carriage only a few months before on the way to the funeral of his own son, Willie Lincoln, who had died of the same thing that James Stanton had died of, typhus. So Lincoln is riding in this carriage, July 13, 1862. He's just come from visiting the troops in the Chesapeake, visiting with George McClellan, his, the, the general of the Army of the Potomac, with whom he has had a very sour relationship. Lincoln felt accurately that McClellan was very, very good at building an army, very good at training an army, very good at maintaining the loyalty of his soldiers, and very poor at making the decision to use it. You may know this quote, but he said McClellan had a case of the slows, meaning that he just couldn't pull the trigger. But it was really worse than that. McClellan had Southern sympathies. McClellan was reluctant to fight for the end of slavery, which he properly understood was a mission that Lincoln, somewhere in his mind, conjoined with the notion of saving the Union. We didn't know how much yet. And he did not believe, McClellan, in a war that would attack private property, especially the institution of slavery. Lincoln leaves the Chesapeake, heads north, his boat goes ashore, actually gets stuck on a, near Kettle Shoals. He gets out, takes a bracing dip in the water. Sometimes historians have said this is the moment when he sort of, that refreshing dip changed his perspective. I, I don't think it was really that simple. But when he arrived in Washington, and attend, went to the funeral of James Stanton on July 13, 1862. He looked to his two carriage mates, two men he had a great deal of respect for, and he said, I'm not interested in arguing this. I'm just telling you this. I'm paraphrasing, of course. But I've decided to free the slaves. There is some debate, as there is about any historical issue, and there is support for various points of view on this, but this is most likely the first point that Lincoln mentions that he's considering an emancipation proclamation. In fact, he's been spending a considerable amount of time in the telegraph office of the War Department working on this. Some of you, how many of you have seen the, the movie Lincoln? I suspect a lot, yes. You'll remember those scenes, I think very well done, of Lincoln in the telegraph office where he loved to go. It was the place he loved to hang out. It was his bar, so to speak. He loved to trade stories with the clerks in there. Uh, there are stories of him uh, sitting with his feet up, just like he does in the movie, chatting it up with the clerks as he waited for information to come in from the front. This was their internet, of course. The telegraph was brand new. So new there was not a telegraph operation in the White House itself. You want to send a telegram from the White House, you had Lincoln's secretaries had to go up the street go to a commercial outfit in order to send a telegraph. It was brand new. Lincoln loved technology, by the way, loved science, loved the idea of the, the power of man to improve his lot, to invent something new. Um, he himself uh, invented, as an invention, as I think he's the only president who actually had a patent on an invention recorded in the patent office, and that was on a device to sort of, ironically, given the story I've just told you about his boat going ashore, to uh, outfit boats with certain kind of protective um, underpinnings so that they would, if they went ashore, they could easily be pushed back into the water. A kind of like flotation device it never was made. But I think he enjoyed working on it and coming up with the idea. He loved the idea of invention. He wrote some papers about invention and the importance of 
invention to the American idea. And you could even say that his notion of what it was to be an American, what our founding documents contain, was not something that was absolute and set in stone, but was something that each generation needed to improve upon in the way that an inventor improves upon our situation by creating new freeing devices. So Lincoln is on his way to the funeral and he says this to his two colleagues and uh, is referencing something that he's been working on so intensely in the telegraph office that he scribbles on a piece of paper some of the ideas of how he's going to create this Emancipation Proclamation and puts it into a drawer and locks the drawer. Tells the clerk there, you can look at it, but I don't want you, I want you, you can look at it, but no one else. I don't want anybody passing this around. I don't want anybody this idea to get out that what I'm doing here, you know what I'm doing. And he is actually writing an Emancipation Proclamation. Now, what were the things that had to go through his mind that made this so difficult? I mean, I want to say that's one of the questions that I wanted to answer when I first looked at this idea of writing a book about the Emancipation Proclamation. What was so hard that it took him months, really years, to come to the conclusion that there, the slaves needed to be emancipated and that he needed to do it, particularly during this war? And there really are many reasons why it was so difficult. For one, he did not have the power simply to free the slaves. That would be a use of executive power that was contrary to the constitutional limits of the executive. It would be a taking because it was private property. So Lincoln would be uh, uh, acting again contrary to the constitutional prohibition on the taking of private property. Lincoln was a believer in the Constitution, and he was a lawyer. So he understood these things to be particularly problematic for him in the middle of a war. So how did he grab the power that would allow him to free the slaves in 1863? And to him, the only justification he could make would be that it was a use of his war power, his power as commander in chief, as the head of the army, to use it in the furtherance of the war aims for the North. Even there, it was questionable. Because as he just learned from McClellan, and he didn't need to have McClellan tell him this, the taking of private property, even in war circumstances, the targeting of private property, the targeting of civilians and civilian institutions was contrary to the rules of warfare, to the way we understood warfare to the way the generals taught at West Point understood warfare. So he would be breaking new ground, so to speak, in that. He would need, therefore, to justify this somehow as a new use of war powers that he had as commander in chief of the army and only use the power in the furtherance of war. What did that mean? That meant that he could only free the slaves in the belligerent states. He had to leave slavery in force in the border states and anywhere in the north where there was still, there was, slavery was still practiced because those were not states that were at war with the Union. That meant he would be declaring a freedom for slaves in the places where he had no control over and the places he had control over, leaving it intact. There's so many sort of ironic or counterintuitive notions about the Emancipation Proclamation. Think of it this way, too. He has spent a good portion of his life condemning slavery up to this point. And the one reason, the one justification that he is not making for the end of slavery or the Emancipation Proclamation is that it's the right thing to do, is the moral argument. He cannot make the moral argument. The argument has to always be framed in the furtherance of the war effort. 
This is embedded in the document that he's trying to write. He also knows that this could be political dynamite. I mentioned before that in the first two years of the war, there's a growing fatigue over this war in the North, a worry that this mission is not worth losing the boys off the farm, not worth this loss of life. Slavery, while more objectionable to northern audiences than southern audiences, was nonetheless not something that the North was necessarily willing to fight for. Indeed, there were a lot of worries, particularly in the Midwest, that if the slaves were freed, that the outcome would be that, the, that they would flee to the North, the freemen would flee to the North, and that the, the labor, uh, the, the jobs in the North would be sacrificed, particularly along the, shore, along the, uh, uh, the Ohio River, to these new, the new free black labor. So there were worries, deep worries, that this was politically uh, wrongheaded, it was constitutionally wrongheaded, that it was strategically wrongheaded with respect to the military operation, yet he had to write this now because he felt that he'd reached the point where the mission for the war needed to be amended. July 22nd, 1862, he reads it to the full cabinet for the first time, tells them the same thing. I'm not here to ask for your opinion about this. I'm not here to argue this. I just want to let you know that this is what I'm going to do. Secretary Stewart at this point has decided that his one piece of advice on this is to Lincoln that he not issue the Emancipation Proclamation in the summer of 1862 because it will look like a desperate gesture. The war is going so poorly for the Union, it'll look like he's pulling out all the stops for one last final gesture because he knows he's losing. He says, wait for a victory. Then issue this as a kind of crowning of the victory itself, bring some manner of drama to it in a sense, make it something that's much more powerful if you issue it when you are in a point of victory. Lincoln agrees to hold off, puts the document in his pocket essentially, and the rest of the summer he spends his time denying it. How ironic, again, here's a man we associate with the phrase, the great emancipator. He is taken two years to get to the point of thinking about amending the war mission to include emancipation, and then when he finally does, he spends two to three months denying that he's even doing it. He invites a group of black leaders to the White House in August of 1862, and he says to them, you know, there really is no future for us together. There is no future for the black and the white race living in harmony in the United States. Why don't you, oh, it goes further, he says, but for the presence of your race, we would have no war. But for the presence of your race, we would have no war. After he says this, and it's published the next day in the Washington Papers, Frederick Douglass, the great black leader, says this is like the horse thief blaming the presence of a horse for his crime. Outraged, as many abolitionists are, that, that President Lincoln is going around blaming the death on the slave race. Now, he could have meant, and let's give him this, if only to use as a parenthetical to what I just said, he could have meant that with what we've done to you, with the history that we have with you now, it is impossible for us to ever erase this. We cannot ever have harmony. And yes, if we had never brought the slaves, there never been a slave trade that brought the slaves to, to the United States, we wouldn't have had a war over slavery. He could have meant that. 
He was certainly pessimistic about the future for racial harmony in the United States, and maybe that is what he meant. Some historians have actually said that he instead was doing this in order to prepare the political climate for what he was about to do, issuing an Emancipation Proclamation. In other words, let the white northern voters know that he wasn't convinced that this war needed to be fought over slavery. And in fact, one of the things that Lincoln also says to this gathering of black leaders is, why don't you lead a movement of your people out of the United States to Panama? There had already been movements, as you probably know, to, re to colonize the black, free black race in Sierra Leone and uh, uh, Liberia in Africa. He had had conversations with a developer who had land in Panama that he wanted to see if he could move great swaths of black uh, Americans to Panama, colonize them off the, off the continental US so that we wouldn't have to actually face the issue of racial harmony going forward. The black leaders who are with him are just outraged, by the way. They are, they are to a man, rejecting of this proposal. A few weeks later, a number of religious leaders from Chicago come to visit Lincoln in order to press him on emancipation. And he says to them, why would he emancipate the slaves? Why would he issue an emancipation proclamation? This all, by the way, while the document itself is sitting in his drawer. Why would he do that when, and then he goes through the litany of things I told you earlier, the constitutional problems with the use of that, that kind of executive power. He talks, about, he, he, he talks about how politically stupid it would be for him to do this. How he would only be uh, freeing the slaves in places where he had no control and leaving intact with exactly the arguments people made about the Emancipation Proclamation and can make to this day about its effectiveness. He says it would be like issuing, like. The Pope's bull against the comet. Now, I had to look this one up, I have to tell you. It refers to Pope Calixus XIII, you all know him, I'm sure, <laughs> who, upon seeing the apparition we now know as Halley's Comet, issued an edict or a bull against it, saying it was a satanic uh, invasion. And so he was saying it was as silly as the Pope's bull against the comet meant it would be so futile why would I ever issue an Emancipation Proclamation? He's denying it. He's denying it left. He's denying it right. Is he, what's going on in his head? I mean, it's sort of fascinating, isn't it? I mean, here's a man who spoke so eloquently about the need for the end of slavery in the 1850s. Now, one of the things we should recognize is that Lincoln's notion of the end of slavery was always one that was going to be gradual and compensated. At one point in 1858, when Stephen Douglas, in the famous Lincoln-Douglas debates, challenges Lincoln about uh, his desire to end slavery in the moment, Lincoln says, no, 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 no. I mean, look, I'm looking for a gradual, compensated, phased out end of slavery. It could take 100 years, he says, before we're its ultimate extinction. 100 years, could you imagine? This would be slavery to 1958, the time of Elvis Presley and Eisenhower, and four years after Brown versus the Board of Education. Now, was he serious, or was he just merely countering Douglas? Was he using this as a, a kind of, 100 years meant just sort of, it may take a long time, but even a long time, can you imagine? Lincoln, when he talks about a gradual compensated end of slavery, even as president, is thinking in terms of slavery existing in some form or another, where its final phase out may take till 1900, he says at another point. Well, even that is 38 years later. But now, contained in the document that he's writing is the notion it's actually, it's, it's, in many ways, what the Emancipation Proclamation, as he's written, it is a war-framed document in which he says, it, in a sense of a threat, if the belligerent states do not do this, 
Then I will free the slaves on January 1, 1863. And the, this is work for a gradual, compensated end to slavery without any qualifying language that indicates the amount of time in which that gradual, compensated end to slavery would take place. September 17, uh, Antietam happens, the worst uh, single day in American military history. Let me put it differently. The worst single day for bloodshed um, in American war history. McClellan uh, gains what might be called a qualified victory in that Lee, Lee retreats. Lincoln is furious with McClellan that he does not follow Lee out, uh, but allows him to escape. But nonetheless, it's enough of a victory that five days later, Lincoln issues what we call the Preliminary Emancipation Proclamation. There's a lot of confusion sometimes between the, what this is, the Preliminary Emancipation Proclamation, and the one that's actually signed on January 1, 1863. The September 22nd Emancipation Proclamation, September 22nd, 1862, it is a document of threat. It is not the document of full force of the law. Now, what would have happened if the belligerent states had taken Lincoln up on the offer? Very interesting to contemplate. We know, I shouldn't say we know, there's a lot of speculation, and I, and I agree with this, that Lincoln's hedging was not so brilliant, such a brilliant piece of politics. I think it was some of his humanity emerging. I use humanity here in a different way than you may be used to hearing the term by that. I mean, he's not the mythic pedestal, pedestaled, if he could be pedestaled, figure of American history. He is human. He is scared. He is scared that this could make the war worse for him. He is scared that this could make him a one-term president. He is scared that if he frees the slaves, what that will mean is a message to the to the slaves to rise up in a kind of bloody uprising and take down their former slave masters, or the opposite, there'll be a kind of genocide unleashed in the South where the slaves themselves are slaughtered. He doesn't know, he doesn't know what's going to happen. And so Lincoln, I believe, is really teetering back and forth. He himself is showing his doubt, his, his very mortal way of thinking about the world and what he has, has in front of him. You know, it's a very interesting study to look at Lincoln's notion of religion and of God and of free will. Very fascinating studies on this done by many historians. And of course, he was raised in a kind of uh, Calvinist um, home and yet was fond of, in, in his own life, of the writings of Tom Paine and of rationalists who rejected religion. He never joined a church in his entire life. You could argue he was a religious skeptic. There's a lot of justification for looking upon him as at most perhaps a deist, like the founders were deists. He believes, as a lawyer, I believe in human reason, in Counts himself as a rationalist and the ability, as we said, with invention for man to improve his lot. He's a progressive in that sense. And yet his two years in office have convinced him, in part, and these writings emerge in very private writings of Lincoln submitting to a kind of higher power. We're recognizing a higher power, the notion that he really doesn't have the power of agency to effect change, that as he says in the second inaugural, both sides pray to the same God. Both sides think they're right, and yet only one can be right. He believes finally that there is a design to human experience that is being controlled by a higher power, and that as much as he may strive to do the right thing, it may not be 
that that thing will happen. So I believe what we see in these six months going from July 1862 to January 1, 1863 is a man who is all too human, who is faced with death, death in his own private life, the loss of his son, the dying soldiers, the enormous number of dead from Antietam, the enormous responsibility that he presides over a nation that is at war with itself, his belief that slavery was abhorrent to the American idea. You know, there's a very interesting discussion that Lincoln undertakes on this question as well as to what is the primary founding document of the American identity. Is it the Constitution or is it the Declaration of Independence? And on the one hand, you have the Declaration of Independence, which is really a revolutionary document, but, and it mentions equality. It mentions a higher power, two things that the Constitution does not mention, at in its original form, unamended by the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. But it's a revolutionary document. It is a, it is a call to arms. And the Constitution is a document of law. It has the force of law. And yet Lincoln sees one as written into the other and the, as the Declaration as representing a fundamental element of the American identity that is ultimately needs to be represented in the Constitution itself. Very interesting argument for a lawyer to make when you think about it. In November of 1862, the, the midterm elections happen. Lincoln's party does not do well. Lincoln stops mentioning the Emancipation Proclamation, it seems. Many in the abolitionist community wonder whether he has given up on it. Frederick Douglass, in particular, believes that Lincoln had second thoughts, that he was not going to go through with it. As late as the annual message to Congress in December, Lincoln makes a number of other gestures to the South to, again, affect a gradual compensated end to slavery. Doesn't mention the Emancipation Proclamation that he is time to issue only a few weeks later. And so there's a general pessimism, particularly in the abolitionist community, that Lincoln's actually going to come through and deliver. He does, as we all know, on January 1. And I'd like to read to you something from the day that New Year's Eve in 1862. Along with making the final edits on the impending proclamation, Lincoln spent New Year's Eve day occupied with other executive business, and there was plenty. He prepared to meet with his top general, Ambrose Burnside, knowing that he would have to tell him that he had lost confidence in him. This is after Fredericksburg. This is, of course, after he had fired McClellan in October. But he still was frustrated in finding a general he could count on that junior officers from Burnside's staff had come to complain about him and that he was ready to request that Halleck personally review all of Burnside's future plans, a humiliating situation for any general, but especially one who had just been shamed in battle. One other parenthetical about what we were talking about earlier, about the notion that the Constitution doesn't um, countenance the taking of private property, that Lincoln, in issuing the Emancipation Proclamation, was actually broaching new ground uh, in, in war fighting. It is at this point, right around this time, that the war shifts from being McClellan's war to Lincoln's war. And in becoming Lincoln's war, it takes on a new kind of ruthlessness. I was at a conference last week in, at the National Infantry Museum in Columbus, Georgia, called The Hard Hand of War. I was there to speak about Lincoln's shift from this moment to a new, harder, more brutal kind of war 
perhaps more Clausewitzian in its character. But he hadn't quite gotten there yet at this moment. Lincoln came to an agreement with the entrepreneur Bernard Koch for the resettlement of 5,000 former slaves on the coast of Haiti. No matter what he would do by morning, and no one knew for sure, Lincoln had not given up on colonization. He also met with a piteous old lady of genteel appearance, that was his description of her, who had been evicted from her home by the War Department and had no place to go. Lincoln dashed off a note to Secretary of War Stanton asking him to look into the matter. Then, as night fell on the streets of Washington, Lincoln went to his study and he paced. Robert Lincoln later told a friend that his father stayed up the entire night. Why the younger Lincoln waited decades to reveal that tantalizing fact, and he didn't until the, almost the 1920s, is unknown. But if true, what a cinematic scene it suggests, especially from our vantage point of 150 years of history. This being, by the way, I didn't note this, notice this at the, note this at the beginning. Today is the anniversary of the death, the 150th anniversary of the death of Abraham Lincoln. Yesterday was the shooting. You probably heard this in a lot of news reports, but today was the death. And I feel honored to be in front of you talking about him at this moment. There is Lincoln, our mythic Lincoln, whoever that Lincoln may really be, alone in his cold, dark study in what was likely the first time in a long time when he could permit himself the luxury of concentration. You know, he, he was so challenged for time that um, he was asked to reserve Thursday afternoons so he could mourn the loss of his son, Willie. And everyone knew that on Thursday afternoons, for a particular period of time, he had to be left alone, just so he could mourn the loss of his own child. Well, we do not know what, for certain what happened on this particular night. Tad, that was his younger son, usually fell asleep in his father's study, and eventually Lincoln would pick up the boy and carry him to bed. But once Lincoln was alone and settled into the enveloping silence, what went through his mind? Robert Lincoln said his mother, before her retiring, repeated her own personal opposition to the proclamation. But even then, Lincoln, in reply, had not revealed his intentions. He simply paced, pausing once in a while to read a few foot favorite verses from the Bible, and to gaze through the White House window at the night sky. The six months preceding this had been transformative for him. He had built a career on reason and argument, on the powers of human agency to affect change. His entire life was an example of that Enlightenment creed, a self-educated backwoodsman of questionable birth, whose literary, oratorical, and political labors brought him to the greatest of heights. Yet the awful war and the exasperating task of ending slavery had reawakened in him a humbling respect for the unreasonable, for what he did not know and for what he could not know. It was uncanny. The same sort of personal epiphany had occurred around all the challenges in his life. He had trusted the war to men who plotted the movement of troops and artillery with slide rules and diagrams, yet they had failed. And now, in light of their failure, he leaned toward a more muscular, less cerebral war one that permitted any act deemed to be a military necessity, any act that furthered the intended ends of the war. He had believed in a gradual, peaceful, and compensated path to the extinction of slavery, one that took into account the interest of both slaveholders and slaves, that rejected the riskiness of sudden emancipation with its harsh rebuke and potential for violence. Yet here he was, hours from freeing the slaves, not by the construction of some deliberate and measured plan vetted by the legislative process, but by presidential fiat announced from the barrel of a gun. Ironically, for someone accused of such a bold-faced grab for power, Lincoln had privately moved increasingly toward a submission to the will of something greater than himself. The idea was by no means new for him. Indeed, it recalled his 1848 profession of youthful interest in the doctrine of necessity, which asserted that there was no free will, that one's actions were directed by some exterior force in the fulfillment of an eternal yet essentially unknowable design. Lincoln may have described this force as the almighty God, and indeed his references to providence and to the divine being increased as the conditions in the war and the presidency got worse. 
but it was the same God he had contemplated in the September meditation on the divine will. This was a little note that he had left in his desk drawer found by his secretaries after his death, but they believe, and there's some argument about this now, but they believe that it dated to September 1862. A God is a force of inevitability of cause and effect of the working out of a process only he, only God, could understand. This philosophy stressed equality. Ironically, the president upon whom so many great man theories of American history depend saw himself as no different than anyone else. No one was less or more responsible for the conditions of the world than the next person because all were helpless to change events as they were directed from above. When Mary and Robert arrived in Lincoln's study in the morning, asking what he had decided, the president looked up at them, a great light illuminating his face, and answered, I am under orders. I cannot do otherwise. Thank you all very much. Thank you. take any questions, ideas, comments, vegetables thrown my way, whatever you might want to do. Yeah, I'm oh, sorry. You, uh, oh, think no you problem. Reason? Ladies and gentlemen, we'll go ahead and have a few questions and answers now. If you could please raise your hand and we'll bring you the, uh, the uh, stick mic. Please keep in mind that we are recording this tonight, uh, so we will not be able to pick you up unless you do speak into the mic. Carl. So don't say anything you might regret either. It'll be on YouTube for an eternity. I have a question. Uh, do we know if he read uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin or ever met Harriet Beecher well, Stowe? Well, he, he didn't, you know, he, there's that famous anecdote about him meeting Harriet Beecher Stowe and saying, so you're the little lady who caused this great war. Um, you know if he read the book? I, I, I don't know that he made any of the reference to the, to the uh, book itself. Um, my really intense interest focused on this six-month period, so I'm not sure I can speak to the other moments, but I haven't read anything that indicated that he discussed it at any point. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm Andy Terrell from the Strategic Studies Institute here. Oh, Andy. Our flag has been at half mass today, and I, um, I wanted to thank you for coming here on this day. I did not want to let this day pass without acknowledging what happened 150 years ago. So it's especially good that you could, could be here for that. Well, I, I am. Uh honored to be here. Um, I feel the gravity of the moment, and I, I, I suspect that a lot of you do too, and that you came out for this. What an amazing thing that a man's life, 150 years later, still has this power, and, and yet it does. And, and that relates to a question I was going to ask, uh, ask to you, in that um, a number of subsequent presidents have often looked towards Abraham Lincoln for inspiration and for um, a model of certain kinds of behavior and coping with crises. Uh, President George W. Bush, I think, read something like 10 books on Lincoln while he was in office. President Barack Obama, of course, was, uh, has been described as a absolute Lincoln fan and was very, very interested, especially in Doris Kearns Goodwin's book on Team of Rivals. And I just wondered as a as someone who has written a, a, a very good book on Lincoln, which I haven't literally read, but I have listened to as a book on CD. I think you even might have read that. Uh, I, did, I was the reader of the yeah, book, yes. Yeah, your voice sounded like this. The, uh, but um, if, you've, if you saw any kind of ripples of that, if you felt any um, business with, uh, with, my goodness, the president, whichever president is interested in what, in what I'm writing, and uh, if, as you talk to other Lincoln scholars, if, if that kind of topic ever came up. So I guess the question then is if I felt the gravity of the importance of writing about somebody upon whom so many presidents look for inspiration. Um, uh, well, I, I didn't write thinking that I had Barack Obama over one shoulder and <laughs> George W. Bush over the other one. Um, I wrote because this interested me uh, and I thought it would interest a lot of other people, and I thought I had a particularly interesting take upon Lincoln. Uh, it gives me, I, I'm, I'm, you know, as an American, I'm grateful for the fact that presidents of both parties look to Lincoln for inspiration. 
uh, I think, important, as you could tell from the way I spoke about him today, that we remember that he was also a human being. I think that makes the inspiration even deeper, that we don't look upon him as, uh, um, as a God figure. I mean, there was a temptation to do that in the years after his death, particularly in the poetry that he was shot on Good Friday. I mean, he became this Christ figure for the American story. Uh, fascinating books written about Lincoln in American memory, one by Merrill Peterson, looking at how the image of Lincoln was, was raised up to such great heights, in the, particularly in the early years of the 20th century, after the Lincoln Memorial was erected. And um, I, I do think it's really important uh, for presidents to look to historical examples for inspiration. Uh, I was chatting with uh, Carl on the way in here about how, uh, you know, I ran a center for oral history at West Point for f more than five years, and how one of the things that struck me was that Americans, American veterans, but Americans of all professions have a certain naivete where they believe the rest of the world must, all, must just be like we are. They don't understand the blood feuds that have been going on for centuries. And, we heard, I heard this from veterans who served in Bosnia as well as Iraq and other places that it's incomprehensible that people are not driven by principle, they're driven by you know, what happened a thousand years ago. And so much of the rest of the world works that way, but we don't, thankfully. And uh, yet our history in the working out of these ideas that we hold to be so dear um, is rich with the elemental stuff of inspiration I don't mean just making us feel good about it. I mean inspiration, the form that, that informs what, how we can deal with contemporary crises. So knowing that Bush and Obama both look to Lincoln um, is a good thing. Uh, and if, if any future presidents would like to read my book, I'd be glad to send them a copy. <laughs> Uh, I think the gentleman, uh, Carl over here is going to bring you the microphone. I guess the thing that surprises me most, being a veteran of government myself, is that he could tell his cabinet, many of whom didn't like him, certainly reading the uh, Band of Rivals, how they managed to keep it secret so long, how come it never leaked. Could you speak on that? Yeah, you know, I, you know, it's really interesting that um, uh, the historical materials on Lincoln are, uh, despite the fact that there's 23,000 books, or whatever it was I mentioned at the beginning, written about Lincoln, the historical material from which we work is really rather scant. Um, and questionable. And... Um, so I, I'm not sure, I, I know exactly how they kept that secret, I'm not even sure that they did. But by that I mean that there was so much written about Lincoln, particularly in the early years, that was meant, that was self-aggrandizing to the author, you know, or to the memoirist, right? Um, one of the principal sources used by all historians on the Emancipation Proclamation is a book written by Francis Carpenter, who was a painter who painted something called the first reading of the Emancipation Proclamation. He painted what was the scene of that July 22nd meeting that I told you about, which you're referring to. And a couple of years later, 1864, he meets Lincoln in a receiving line, and he asks if he can move into the White House and paint this great historical painting, which now hangs in the Capitol, by the way, and do so by bringing the cabinet members in and, and painting them as portraits, and then inserting them the way that a lot of historical, grand historical paintings do. And after Lincoln was killed, he wrote a book in 1866 uh, called, um, oh no, I don't, can't remember the name, Six Months at the White House, as it's called, um, in which he uh, tells the story about Lincoln stopping by in the room that, that, that Carpenter was working in, in the White House, and he tells him stories about how the Emancipation Proclamation was written and how it was received, and, and Carpenter was this adoring fan of Lincoln. I mean, he just thought Lincoln was the greatest. Um, and not a reporter, not an historian, and 
was working from presumably his own memory of these conversations with Lincoln well after the Emancipation Proclamation had been already been issued. I say that because that's sort of a totally unreliable source when you look at it, and yet it's one of our primary, one of our only sources of Lincoln supposedly speaking about it. And yet there are other people who claim that they saw the Emancipation Proclamation, or there was, I'm sorry, that, that it was, they were told of it even before this July 13th uh, carriage ride. So how they kept it, I, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, I don't know. Pardon me? What the press would have done with it. Yes. Yeah. Well, that's the amazing thing. As he's going, you'd think as he's going through those two meetings I described in late August and early September, first with the black leaders and then with the religious leaders, and they're writing about these in the press. You can find the press reports on these, and you'd think, I mean, first of all, you have to think of Lincoln. How did he feel denying? I mean, it's almost that's almost biblical too. He's denying his own. Fascinating, I don't know. More questions? I'm just curious, where was the first public reading? My brother uh, told me that it was in, um, it was in South Carolina, I forget the name, Buford, South Carolina. First reading of the Emancipation Proclamation? Yes, after it was issued. Yeah, um, I don't know where, the, where there was a public reading, there was a publishing of it, which leads to an interesting story. Lincoln, Lincoln received, you know, the document had to be hand drafted, of course, and it was brought to him for signature. And the salutation was written incorrectly. Uh, there was a certain salutation for proclamations, which by the way, just looking at contemporary resonance here, a proclamation as we're referring to with the Emancipation Proclamation is not like we think of proclamations today, which are, you know, it's, um, you know, the American Basket Association National Week or whatever it may be, I, I, but, but it's more like an executive order. That's, that's the way it was understood. And so there was a certain salutation that Lincoln used for what we would today call executive orders, which was his proclamation had to have in order to have the right character and form. And so he said, no, 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 I can't sign this and sent it back. Seward's son was the, uh, I believe the assistant secretary at the time, and he was the one who had drafted it, had it drafted, and he brought it there. So he takes it back, and at this point, um, someone in the State Department figures out they have a, you know, a hot tip here, and they give it off to the newspapers, and it gets published before Lincoln has actually even signed it. And um, when it does, uh, word spreads, and there's this fascinating story uh, about, uh, uh, Frederick Douglass and other Oliver Wendell Holmes and great other uh, abolitionist leaders who were in a theater in Boston waiting on New Year's Day for word to come. And they have a, a line of people going out the theater all the way to the telegraph office so that when word comes into the telegraph office that the Emancipation Proclamation has indeed been issued, they will pass it by word of mouth all the way from person to person to person until they, someone walks into the theater and yells, it has been signed. And the place erupts into a pause and there's bands and there's marching and there's general uh, elation over this. So it is issued, uh, I mean that, that, tel that uh, telegraph comes on the basis of the uh, unsigned, uh, improperly salutated, if that's a word, document that had been leaked to the press. But only hours later they had the real one, so. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit about, uh, if your research has found any, what was the immediate reaction of the leadership of the Confederacy to this document? Yeah, um, outrage, I mean, in general. I mean, there, uh, particularly on the idea that it was a, a breach of the civilized um, rules of warfare. You just don't, you don't attack a civilian institution like this. Um, Jefferson Davis immediately issues a response this way. Uh, you know, there was uh, um, a belief that it was unfair, therefore, uh, and that it would be ineffectual. Um, interestingly, the other, the other response that's worth noting is the response of the slaves themselves, many of whom heard about the Emancipation Proclamation before their 
the, the slaveholders had because word of mouth on something so exciting passed very, very quickly. Um, uh, and of course, uh, one thing I did not mention is, and I realize this is somewhat off of what you're, you're asking about the Confederacy, but I will say this, and perhaps it very much was in the mind of the Confederate leaders, within the document, the final document, one of the very difficult pieces of, of wording was, number one, to encourage the freed slaves not to seek violence against their former masters, because Lincoln was so worried about this idea of a, of a, of a uh, civil uprising. And the second was, uh, and this was the work of, um, principally of uh, Sam and Chase, pushing this to get it into the document, that the freed slaves would be welcome uh, to enlist in the Union Army upon their own freedom. And imagine what a difference this made, and it did, in the ranks of the Union um, uh, at a time when there was so much desertion. Um, there are stories, great stories, of the Union Army as a kind of army of liberation moving throughout the South and, and freeing the slaves as they do, and then almost immediately they pick up as, as recruits to the new army and how powerful this was to the uh, conduct of the rest of the war. Yes. The proclamation freed slaves in rebellious states on paper, but how was it enforced throughout the South? I, I, I couldn't quite hear the question. The proclamation freed slaves. It, it freed slaves on paper. Right. On, in the South, but how was that enforced throughout the South? Well, as I said, first off, indeed, Lincoln was right. Uh, issuing it had no force in the states over which he had no control, but it did turn the Union Army into an army of liberation, meaning that everywhere it went, it would, and it, where it attained victories, it would free the slaves upon its moment of um, liberation. Uh, so. Um, the story that going forward from there is, of course, much more complicated, um, but it's not the subject of my book, so. Other questions? Did the uh, British Parliament uh, and British leadership have a heads up on this? And, th and when they got the word, what was the impact? Yeah, well, um, they did not have a heads up. They, uh, of course, this was another motivating factor for the, uh, Lincoln to issue the Emancipation Proclamation when he did, his fear over that the, the British would recognize the Confederacy and he preempted it with the, with the issuing of the Emancipation Proclamation. Interesting part of the story. Other questions? Yes. This will be the last question. Sure. So Chuck Allen here at the War College also. So how was this uh, proclamation received by the military members that were going to execute the campaign plans and fight the battles? And when they had now this opportunity to free the contraband of the slaves, how, how was that taken? Yes, I, I believe the question was how did the military leaders in the Union Army receive uh, that they were now um, uh, going to be fighting for an end of slavery and not just uh, much better than, than uh, Lincoln would have thought and much better than probably would have occurred if he had issued the Emancipation Proclamation a year earlier. And in fact, uh, this is one of the reasons why many historians have concluded that Lincoln was a master of timing, that if he had made uh, um, an end to slavery a part of the war aims early in the war, that he would have had many, uh, m much more friction from his uh, union ranks than he, than he uh, had by the time we get to 1863. Well, thank you all very much. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you.